Anybody late that didn't get a copy of our upcoming seminars, you guys? Know? Appreciate you guys coming tonight. We're we've got a list of seminars there we're going to be doing. Uh, we are going to have probably one in November, probably the first Thursday. I haven't nailed that down yet, but uh, we're hoping maybe have C.A. Richardson from the Flats class. Kind of trying to do seasonal. Our tarpon's a little late, but I'm going to do a trolling for grouper right the day before it opens. Then we got the guys from. Uh, the radio show we sponsored, Dan Garino, Jason Prieto, and Rick Lyles coming in to do one the end of the month. And then we got, if you like to fly fish, we got Captain Rick Grassett, who's probably one of the best known fly fishermen in the Bay Area. And we got Randy Rochelle doing a kingfish seminar, getting ready for all the tournaments and all that. And like I said, next week we got a, Neil Taylor does a great kayak fishing seminar if you like to fish out of a kayak. He teach you a lot of real neat little things that might take you a long time to learn. So, uh, how many people on a boat? Hi. The rest of you fish kayak and offshore piers, right? Onshore. Yeah, right. Off of Off the beach or off the sea wall. All right, just trying to figure out what we want to cover tonight. Um, Tackle-wise, I don't get too heavy. I mean, everybody's got their favorites. Beef for the flats, if I'm throwing live bait, artificials, I like the seven and a half foot spinning rod, a medium to medium wide action. I like a pretty moderate tip on it. The more moderate the tip, the further it's good, the rod's going to throw for you, and the less you're going to have to put into it to make that cast. If you've never, if you've always fished seven foot and shorter, and you've never used a seven and a half, you won't believe the distance that you're going to get in the seven and a half. Eight foot to me, strictly more a live bait rod. Seven and a half is still light enough; it's not going to fatigue you a lot. I like Daiwa a lot. I've been, I've got plenty of Shimano stuff too, but Daiwa for for braided line, I love their air bale design. To me, that's one of the best designs going in a bale. Because where people get most of their wind knots are made right on the bale. If your bale has like a jog in it, and you cast and flip your bale and you're not careful and look, if it doesn't go all the way into the roller, after you make a couple of wraps, it gets tight, and all of a sudden you pull it and you got what you call a wind knot. Basically, it's made on the reel. So, that was air bale design, slides right into the line roller, which is where you want to, you know, how many guys fish braid? Braid everybody? Still some mono guys? <laughs> Once you fish braid, I tell you, for spooling, between here and my store, I used to have, I mean, I spool 85, 90% braid. It's that popular now. Because once you fish with it, flats fishing and me fishing with, with mono is like fishing with a rubber band after you use braid. It's just, there's so much stretch to it. Uh, but everybody here is wind knots, wind knots, wind knots. You can, if you're fishing 10 pound and it's windy, you might have it loop around a guide once in a while, but 90% of your knots are made on the reel. So once you cast, if you do what Captain Mel used to say, flip the bale by hand, which generally helps it go into the roller, and then just make sure you got any slack out before you start the reel. If you're throwing a flood, you wing it out there, just physically look. If you got to move your rod eight inches, take up the slack. You eliminate 90% of those knots. They just don't happen. Anymore. So people that are intimidated by braid, mono does the same thing. Braid just magnifies the problem. Uh, I like 10 to 15 pound braid. I've had 50 pound cobia to the boat on on a 15 pound braid. You know, as long as you use a drag, that's what a drag's for—not to be locked down, but. Um, 
I like a 2,500 to a 3,000 size. A lot of guys feel they need that big 4,000 to me. If you're making a lot of artificial cast or anything like that, that's just an, a lot of extra weight at the end of 200 casts a day. You'll feel a huge difference between a 25 or a 3,000. With brake, you don't need that big reel. You know, you can pack. I like about a 120, 125 yards of braids, all you need. If you ain't got to him by then, he's done wrapped you around a pile in a crab trap, somebody else's boat, or... Uh, so, I don't load my reel totally, I like some backing on it, and just a top shot. You need to keep it as full as you can, just like any reel. But, uh, Shimano went to that new tapered spool. They claim it gives a little more cast. I can see that a little, but they really cut their line capacity down when they went to that spool on their smaller reels. They used to have the ABS spool like Daiwa, which is a flat, where they came out instead of the tapered, they have a flat. You can spool it all the way to the outside edge so you can get a lot of cast before it starts rubbing the rotor. That's another reason I've always liked that spool design and the uh, tail design. But Penn makes some great reels. The Battle right now is probably one of the hottest reels there is for a hundred bucks. Uh, Rod-wise, I'm a Falcon guy. I've been fishing Falcon for about 15 years. Uh, they've got a Coastal Series, which I have one of, which is their newer. They claim they're most saltwater friendly. They have stainless steel hooded Fuji hardloys, and they just lowered the price. They used to sell for. 109 to 129 down to 90 bucks. You got a, a top shelf cork, you got a, a good Fuji reel seat, you got Fuji hardwood guides, and you got a, a, it's probably like about an IM 7 or 8 blank for 90 bucks. And made in America, lifetime warranty against defects. And rod warranties are kind of smoke and mirrors because if a rod blank is bad, First couple of fish you set it up on, we even usually like to tell you, give me the tip of the rod and let us pull on it. And if it's got a bad spot, it's going to break when we do that. Our first good redfish you set up on, or big Jack Crevel. If it breaks two years from now, you nicked it, you hit it, somebody, one of your friends bumped it, stepped on it, didn't tell you. It, a blank just don't develop, develop a defect. The only thing that you're going to get years from now, your reel seat might come loose and start spinning, your cork might start spinning. That's really about the only things after, say, the first three months that's going to go bad that's really a defect. Some rod companies are very lenient. You know, Loomis has, they used to have a $50, no question asked, now it's $100. And you have to be the original purchaser and have your receipt. So any rod you buy nowadays, if you buy a nice rod, tuck your receipt away because that's your warranty with the manufacturer. Falcon does have a no questions asked, half of retail they will replace it for you. And St. Croix, I think, has something now for about 50, 60 bucks. So a lot of your better companies do offer in case your wife you know, rolls the wind up on it or your buddy steps on it or slams the topper down. How often do you uh, oil your reels? I don't, really, to oil your reel, the only thing you really need to oil is your handle. If you want to take your spool off and put a little oil on your shaft and rotate it up and down, that's a, anything over that I take it and have it serviced. Well, the, the uh, Stratic has a little... Yeah, they put that in there, but they also tell you if you oil it too much, you can mess it up. I think that was a bad move, personally. Um, to me, if you fish a lot, now if you kayak fish and you dunk it a lot, yeah. then I wouldn't spend a lot of money on it. Really? Because you can, the best, I mean, unless you're going to buy a van stall that's pretty much totally sealed or dial is fixing to come out with a cert tape that's like $500 and has this new high tech oil in it with magnets that it's just the neatest stuff you'll ever see. You can have it loose in a jar and put a magnet and it forms like a half moon, looks like a moon rock or something. And it's going to be totally sealed, that's going to be $500. So to me, I try to stay under, say, $100 for a reel if I'm on a kayak or if I beach fish and I wait a lot and I dunk it. Because the better ones aren't, the more bearings you got, the more bearings you got for salt to get in if you dunk it. If you dunk it, best thing I recommend is go stick it in a bucket of fresh water and then take it to a real repair guy as soon as you can. If you let it sit there a week or two, your bearings are there all kind of scald and then they're never going to feel the same without replacing the bearings. So. 
really oiling the handle and a little bit on the shaft, maybe a hair on your bail there, but um, yes sir. Actually kind of get my question, is it okay to just take your reels Dunk it in the pool and, or something? and have a, just a bucket sitting around when you're done fishing? Yeah. Wash them I don't prefer to dunk them, them. I like to just lightly spray them. Yeah. You want to try to get the salt off the best you can, but you don't really want to blast it. You know, I use a nozzle, but I use a mist more. And then washing your guides, if you'll wash the top and the bottom, because a lot of guys will spray one side and they don't get the other. And what kills most guides that aren't stainless steel is the ring is going to rust and eventually break the ceramic falls out. So always try doesn't hurt to take. There are some different soaps out there that don't wash your grease out. I know a lot of offshore captains use. And they take a bucket of water and just wash it with soap and water, and then they lightly rinse it off. I don't really recommend it. I know guys that go dunk it in their swimming pool. I don't recommend that either. I, guess but, uh, <laughs> I don't blast it. I just lightly rinse it. And then if you fish a lot, I try to have it serviced at least once a year. My problem is I've got, I got two boats, my small boat, when I go out, I do a lot of sheep's head stuff yes, at night, and so I put my poles down so I don't get them banged up on the dock, right. and they can inevitably just get sopping wet with salt water, and I best well, spray them off, but they're still, dunk. I mean, if they're not start to feel it in there, you know. Yeah. And that's it, the higher the price wheel, the more bearings, the more bearings you have for salt to get into, so, like I said, if you kayak fish or wade fish a lot, um, and really, if you're wake fit, well, I should say, if you're beach fishing, there's no reason to ever dunk your reel because all the fish are the first six, eight foot off the beach. You don't need to wade out and try to, unless you're trying to maybe catch some mackerel cruising by. Because the fish, you see guys wading to the first bar and then the guide boat will come up and he'll throw his bait on shore and drag it into the trough there. That trough where you step down off the coquinas, that's where 90% of your fish are. That's where the killifish, the sardines, the uh, sand fleas, all the bait is right in that trough. That's why they call it the food trough. And that's where your fish are. Your, your snook are there, your flounder are there, redfish, sheephead, whiting, you know, about everything.